we really need to consider the fact that we're all online now. And when we're online, we're in the context of these big digital um, social networks. Can we turn this down a little bit? It's like feeding back on my ear. Um, anyway, I'll just keep going. So anyway, um, we're in the context of these big social networks and we have to start understanding social learning both at the individual level and then at the group level and the social network level. So how it kind of scales up. And importantly, what are the consequences of the modern situation in which algorithms are actually mediating the social information that we learn from? So we have information filters that are um, having an effect on the different content that we see. So I wanna talk very broadly about that, but I wanna contextualize it with a problem that we've all kind of thought about. It's been very relevant in the context of politics, which is what is the role of social media in the rise of political polarization that we've seen in the US and other countries around the world? And I think this is an interesting applied context in which we can see some of the outcomes of algorithm media social learning. So that's what I'll be talking about today. I wanna to present a conceptual model that myself and some colleagues have been working on, including uh, Josh, who's in the cr crowd here, and then some recent empirical work that looks at some of the outcomes of algorithm mediated learning in the context of politics. So let's start with this question. What is the role that social media plays in political polarization, especially in the US? A lot of us have observations about this, but it's kind of fuzzy about how it compares to traditional media. Um, let's try this again. There we go. How many people know who this is on your left? Obviously, it's Reagan on the right. So who is this? Uh, not quite. Anyone else? So this is Jerry Falwell. So for those of you, yeah, so right, you're on, you're on the right track. So those of you who don't know, Jerry Falwell in the 70s and 80s was a leading evangelical pastor in the U.S. And he played actually a really important role in politics in the U.S. So he had the third most watched TV network in the U.S. behind only HBO and Turner. In fact, there were 20 million households in the late 70s and 80s tuning in to his network. And what was he doing on this network? Well, he was specifically um, broadcasting this message of moralization and outrage stoking that had a very particular intention. It was to organize the political right against the political left. And in fact, Republican Party really outsourced a lot of their organizing to evangelical pastors like Falwell. So if you look at one of his famous speeches, he said, we're fighting this holy war. What's happened to America? The wicked are bearing rule. We have to lead the nation back to this moral stance that made America great. You might notice some similar rhetoric from recent presidents. So the point is that in traditional media, actually, we've seen something similar related to the claims that we see about social media. Oh, well, there's outrage stoking, there's moralization, and it's coming from political elites who have asymmetric control over information on the platforms or on the broadcast. So what I want to argue today is that, yes, social media is actually just a modern context of something we've already seen in traditional media. But at the same time, there's some important differences related to the features of the platforms, including the big social networks, and especially importantly, the uh, algorithms that are playing a role. But we also have to start to think about, um, you know, what is information doing on social media that's different than traditional media? Well, you have this similarity, but there's something that is unique to social media that is coming out. Uh, I like this term collaborative work that comes out of human computer interaction literature. And the idea is you don't just have information being broadcasted, you have information being broadcasted, but then it becomes participatory. So not only do you have uh, hyperpartisan news organizations or political elites saying their messages, but now you have people giving their own commentary, sharing that information themselves. And so then you, not just, you don't just get the information, you get the social component when people are um, sharing the information and we know who those are from people in our social network. And so when it becomes participatory, outrage and moralization become more of a social reality because you see it again, from people who you might follow, people who you're connected to. And for any of us who are social scientists by training, the alarm bells start ringing, off, ringing a little bit because we know that social influence is much more potent when it comes to uh, broader influence than just mere information exposure. So the other thing that I really wanna focus on today is not just the sort of social nature of, of online networks, but also the fact that our understanding of social reality is influenced by content algorithms. 
And this is arguably the most unique component of our social interactions in the digital age. And so what I wanna talk about today is what should we be thinking about as consequences of algorithm mediated learning? <clears throat> so I wanna start with, I wanna unpack this idea of algorithm mediated social learning. And I wanna start with this observation that comes from psychology and social science in general. Humans are prodigious social learners. So we learn not just from direct feedback, we learn from others through observation, we learn from others through reinforcement. There's a lot of ways in which we're just very attuned to social learning. And in fact, this capacity that we have is thought to underlie culture and the accumulation of knowledge over time. So we don't just learn from people who are right in front of us, we learn from history, and that allows us to really build uh, complex uh, societies and it really enhances the efficiency of our social learning. Now, one of the things that's interesting about our social learning is that it's actually biased. And so what I mean by that is we have biases to learn from particular type of individuals and particular types of content. And these biases are thought to be functional in the sense that they actually solve problems and help us learn more efficiently. So for example, we have context biases. We tend to learn from in-group members and we tend to learn from prestigious uh, models more so than other type of models. Now, why is this functional? Well, prestige typically signals success. So if someone is successful, then it's more efficient to learn from them rather than doing trial and error and figuring out all the techniques on whatever problem you're working on that didn't work. So it actually is more efficient to learn from prestigious models. It's also efficient to learn from in-group members because these are the people who have the knowledge most relevant to your current environment. On the other hand, we have biases to learn from certain types of information. Emotional and moral information have been very well studied, our biased attention toward these, um, these sources. And if you think about it, emotional information tends to be the most important, the most relevant. Um, in the context of social networks, for example, moralized information is very important because it's, it helps us keep track of who's violating norms. And if we know who's violating norms, we can sanction them. It helps maintain stable, cooperative social networks. And also as individuals, we can figure out how we need to behave in order to not get sanctioned ourselves. So all of these biases um, are well-documented. And the important point is that they're functional in the sense that they tend to promote adaptive behaviors that lead to cooperation and collective problem solving. So now what I want to do is contrast this function with the function of content algorithms. So now it's very well known that algorithms are in the context of social media platforms. They're designed specifically to capture attention and to maximize engagement. So before we go any further, I think we can see that there's a disconnect here between the functions and the design. On one hand, our social learning biases are specifically functional because they promote cooperation and collective problem solving. But the design of social media platforms is sort of um, neutral on that. They just want to maximize engagement. So if you've been paying attention, you might be able to predict what are the types of content that are most likely to capture our attention and maximize engagement. Well, it's going to be the content that we are biased to learn from and to attend to. So as a side effect of this design to maximize engagement and attention, social um, content algorithms are actually exploiting our social learning biases. And so now there's been decades of research, including some of my own, that confirm, and including research internal to companies like Twitter and Facebook, that confirm that prestigious information, in-group content, moralized and normative, uh, righteous content, emotional content, all of this is systematically uh, amplified by content algorithms because of these goals they have to maximize attention. This is the type of content that naturally is drawing our attention and our engagement. And so the way that I like to summarize this is that content algorithms are exploiting our biases toward prime information. So prestigious in group, moralized and emotional. And so now with this um, setup, I think I can summarize this idea of algorithm mediated social learning. So just to summarize, we have these biases to attend and to learn from prime information. On the other hand, content algorithms are amplifying this content because of their goals to maximize intention and engagement. 
But then here's where the critical piece comes in that I've become very interested in. When you have both of these processes happening in the context of online networks, you also get this feedback effect where because we are attending to prime information and constant algorithms are amplifying that, remember that content algorithms are not just amplifying that information, they're amplifying other people posting that information. And so this kicks in our capacity to learn from others through observational learning, reinforcement learning. Some, um, and I have some studies documenting this. And then as a result, we actually learn to produce more of that content. In fact, more so than we would in other contexts. And so what this ultimately does is oversaturate certain contexts with prime information. So for example, in the context of politics online, you tend to see this. And that leads to an overrepresentation of prime content. And the important point is that when prime content becomes overrepresented in an environment, rather than leading to collective problem solving and cooperation, it starts to do the reverse. It becomes dysfunctional and leads to conflict in things like misinformation. So this is a conceptual model. By the way, I'm happy to answer questions in the middle of the talk. I'm very used to that coming from Kellogg or if you want to wait, whatever you want to do. But this is the conceptual model that I want to start with. Yes. There's certainly a big overlap. Um, I think the way that you can think about it is you can have emotional content that isn't necessarily moralized. So think of it almost like a Venn diagram. I think there is overlap, but there is a theoretical way to distinguish that. So I define a moral emotion, one related to morality, as one that is elicited by a perceived violation or transgression against a moral norm. But you can also have emotions about lots of things, like you saw um, someone, you saw a roadkill. I don't know why I'm thinking of this example. You saw a roadkill on the side of the road and you became sad. So that could be moral, but theoretically, or you're just, you know, you're sad at something else. It doesn't have to be in the moral domain. So for, for an emotion to be in the moralized domain, I think it really has to be triggered by our sense of right and wrong, if that makes sense. It is a fuzzy distinction, but I think you can make it. And I also, I think measurement wise, and I'll show you because I've done a lot of work measuring outrage. It's true, I see, so the other direction. It's true that one of the components of morality is theorized to be emotion, especially in social psychology, we've talked about that, but it's just one component. So emotion, I would argue, is necessary but not sufficient to have a moral piece of content or um, a context of morality. Does that make sense? I just, I would think of it as you can have, you can be highly emotional, but if there's not this specific perception of something relevant to your shared under, cultural understanding of what is right and wrong, then that wouldn't be a case of morality. So if, if they're, so, cause I, I kind of hear you as potentially arguing that they're completely kind of collapsed. And I think if that were the case, then emotion should be sufficient for morality, but it doesn't seem to be the case. I think we have a lot. I mean, yeah, we could talk a lot about this. So I'll just have a final comment and then, yeah, sure. The last thing I'll say is, you know, a lot of um, things that we have moralized can be habitual and, you know, especially depends on your theory of morality, but maybe if you're a virtue ethicist, you might think that there's a lot of things we do habitually that doesn't necessarily evoke emotions, but we have kind of internalized it as something that's moral. So that might be one of these cases. But in general, I think, it's definitely true that they're highly overlapping. It's not super essential for that to be the perfect clean distinction for this model. The point is just that you can actually measure these theoretically differently and then find evidence for them being promoted by content algorithms. Because I think it's actually helpful to do that when you're measuring because things that I look at like moral outrage, those are importantly different from things like happiness, which you could argue content algorithms are amplifying both of those.
But it's a good point. Yes. Yeah, that's I think we could talk a lot about this distinction and there are lots of fringe cases we can come up with, but I think for the purposes of this model, it doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly um, distinguished for it to be useful, I think. So we'll see as I go along if you agree. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, what I actually wanna do is look at some empirical work I've done that looks at some of the outcomes of this process and measures this idea I've been talking about of overrepresentation and social misperceptions that ultimately might lead to things like conflict and misinformation. And I've done um, several studies in the past couple of years now that look at this learning component, but in the studies I'll present today, they're a little bit newer and I wanna look at some of the outcomes of this process. So let me talk about um, a study I did recently that is um, actually was a field study on Twitter. And so I'll tell you about this method and then some of the results. So we were interested in looking at, like I said, the overperception or overrepresentation of outrage in online social networks as a result of this interaction between um, algorithmic amplification on one hand and also just our psychology of social learning. So we collected um, uh, Twitter messages that were being uh, sent in real time in the context of US politics. So we did this a couple of years ago, the data collection. So this was all contentious political topics like um, the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation hearings in the Supreme Court. Basically, if you don't uh, not familiar with that, it was um, a Supreme Court nomination that really could swing um, the US status of abortion. And in fact, we've seen that play out just as predicted. So this was uh, outrage was being enlisted on both sides of the political spectrum. We also were looking at stuff related to the 2020 election and, and views about Trump and Biden. So anyway, we collected all these Twitter messages. And then in real time, we actually classified the outrage using what I call the digital outrage classifier. It's a supervised learning model that I developed, trained on 26,000 political tweets, performs very well. So for us measuring complex concepts, it's like F1 scores between 0.75 and 0.8. Um, but we've shown it works very well in lots of different contexts. So we are measuring their outrage in real time as the participants are um, expressing their, or posting their messages. And then we have actually a pipeline where we direct message them. And we ask the authors, to what extent are you outraged? And to what extent are you happy? And we measure happiness just to have kind of a contrast class of emotions. And so the nice thing about this method is that we're able to message them within 15 minutes of their posting the message. So it actually gets pretty close to them being able to report on their emotions in real time. And we argue this is one of the first uh, methods for getting uh, real reports of emotions so that you can compare it, how the author feels to how other people are observing them. And so that's exactly what we do in the next phase. We have all these messages and we've uh, collected author um, ratings with each of these messages. And then we show them to a set of observers who are on social media. And importantly, the observers, um, every message had 10 observers that viewed them, and they were um, observers across the political spectrum. So there were five Democrats and five Republicans, at least, who observed all of the messages. Um, and they're doing ratings of outrage and happiness just like the authors did. So we're able to actually measure any potential discrepancy between what an author claims they're feeling and what other people uh, think about their emotion. So um, using this method, I'll show you some of the main results. So um, I'm showing you the outrage rating and then the authors versus the observers judgments. And for the authors, these are just raw reports of the ratings. For the observers, it's all of the observers combined who saw the messages. And so what we see right off the bat is a significant difference between authors and observers outrage ratings where authors on average, sorry, observers on average are systematically over perceiving the outrage that message authors are reporting. And the interesting thing about this is we don't see it for happiness. So there's no significant effect here. And so it suggests that there's something specific about 
uh, at least negative emotion, if not moral outrage, when it comes to this overperception. Now, this is actually predicted by our model because outrage is most associated with that prime information. And so it becomes more overrepresented in the social media environment. And we replicated this across three different field studies. So we see identical patterns across three independent field study deployments, all which had three different um, political topics and different authors. So any questions on some of these results? So one of the things that we're interested in looking at again is, well, what is, okay. Yeah, if anything, we find the opposite. So that's definitely a legitimate concern. So one of the ways that we've looked at this, we've looked at it in several ways, but one of the ways, so if you're right that there's kind of this concern, oh, I don't want to appear outraged to researchers, these are all consenting users, um, you know, you would expect that the distribution of self-report outrage should be pretty low. We don't find evidence of that. If anything, it's skewed to be more high in terms of reports. I mean, partially that's because of the types of users that we're studying here, which are these more politically active users. And in fact, I think they're actually highly motivated to express their outrage um, and to kind of report on it. And in fact, some people, because some people just kind of tell us about their outrage without us prompting them to, they're kind of excited to tell the researchers. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is why I'm outraged and, and et cetera. So we don't see evidence that people are motivated to underreport. And another thing to point out, this effect is robust no matter which level of self-reported outrage you look at. So you can imagine, and I have slides here if I pull them up in a minute, but you can imagine the distribution of all the author self-reported outrage. We see overperception at every level there. So it's not just driven by these people who are under potentially underreporting. So the bimodal thing, um, just to be clear, we have authors who we, I actually forgot to mention this. We recruited authors, both who our classifier predicted a high probability of, of expressing outrage, and also a second group of authors who our classifier predicted the opposite. And the point was we wanted observers to have a range of emotions to judge. And so that's why you see the bimodal distribution is actually by design. Sorry, I forgot to mention that very important fact. Yes. Any question about who the observers are. Mm. You said there are five Democrats, five Republicans. Does that mean for each, there, you know, five different Correct. What's the pool of observers? So these are all social media users. They're all political partisans. We roughly match them based on the assumed characteristics of Twitter users. Um, but yeah, that's the broad demographics of the observers. And, and, and how large is the I'm thinking about being an observer in this study and observing tweet after tweet after tweet. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you know, yeah, basically how many uh, outrage versus happiness tweets per, per, there, there could actually be an effect on the observer of seeing more and more outrage. Yeah. So we have 350 observers in every field site appointment. They see a maximum of 25 messages. So we were sensitive to them. I mean, just exhaustion as well. Um, but we randomized the messages that any user sees. So theoretically, that should account for any kind of like general, um, I don't know what you would call it, like uh, contrast effects or something like that. Yeah. 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 Brian. So, so I think I'll get into this a little bit in the follow-up studies that I'll present, which is that there's a lot of interesting questions. Okay, if there's outrage going on, what are the cons? I take so one component of your question I take to be, well, what are the consequences of this? But then also, are people actually getting upset when they have outrage directed at them? Maybe that's the other. I mean, has anyone ever been in an internet toxicity battle? It does actually affect you, I think. But there's a question of well, like how much like offline consequences have. I think I'll talk about that 
um, at least indirectly when we get to the next set of studies. And also we could talk more at the end about that. Okay, so what we wanted to do, oh, the one thing I should also say, before I just flash the data up, we wanted to start to figure out, okay, what are some predictions that will fall out of our model that would suggest that there's something about the social media context in particular? Well, one of the key most robust predictors of what explains observers' likelihood of over-perceiving outrage and messages is actually their time spent to learn about politics on social media platforms. So this is only correlational, and I have some causal data I'll present next, but this at least is suggestive across all the data that there's something about being on the platforms that is informing your priors about the emotions that other people are experiencing, and that is impacting how you perceive any person's emotions. So if you spend more time in these highly politically active groups that express more outrage, that's empirically true, then it's influencing all of your judgments no matter who the, the expressor is. Um, and by the way, this is robust to statistically controlling for ideological extremity. So it's not just about these users being more extreme, also their um, partisan identity strength. So it's not just about them being more strongly identified. There's really something about spending the time on social media. Okay, so now I wanna talk about some of the outcomes and how this might scale up to social network level misperceptions. And so what we did in this case was design some mock uh, social media feeds to kind of simulate people going through um, a social network and, and estimating how their judgments are impacted by algorithmic amplification in their news feeds. So ultimately what we're arguing is that if we manipulate people's feeds so that there's greater amplification of outrage, it's going to impact then their judgments of the net, some network level outcomes and norms of the environment. So what we did in this case is we constructed a mock social media um, environment where participants were assigned either to a high level over perception feed or a low over perception feed. And the important thing in this case is that all of the messages appearing in these mock feeds came from our previous field studies. So we actually know exactly how much outrage each individual message, uh, each author felt and then we also know how people tended to overperceive those messages. So the key manipulation here is that all of these messages are actually uh, controlled for how much outrage the author felt. The only thing we're manipulating is that overperception bias, which we argue is simulating this kind of uh, algorithmic amplification. So what we find here, we first just ask people, well, how morally outraged do you think members of the social network are? So this is getting at this collective understanding of outrage. And there's two results that I want to draw your attention to that I find interesting. So one is perhaps the straightforward finding. If you're in the high overperception news feed, simulating this algorithmic amplification, you're much more likely to think that your social network is more collectively outraged. But this dotted line is representing the mean of all the individuals outraged in the news feed. And so what this is suggesting is that when there's this amplification and this potential overperception bias, actually, when you're making a group level judgment, thinking about your whole social network, it's even more uh, overperceived than just at the individual level. So when you're making these broader level judgments, it exacerbates the overperception bias. The other thing we looked at was um, perceptions of social norms in the social network. So we had the same. Um, the same manipulation here, but now we have them do a norm elicitation task, we call it. And basically now we're showing them a bunch of new Twitter messages that were sent out in this ostensible social network. And then we have them make judgments about all of those new messages. And we're manipulating how outraged these messages are. And what we find after we ask them, well, how socially appropriate is, are these new messages for uh, the social network that you've been embedded in? we find that there's um, significant increases in their judgments of social appropriateness if they've been in this high overperception perception newsfeed. So the point is, now they think that the social norms of expressing outrage are more, um, or that expressing outrage is more normative in this environment. And as we know, norms are potentially very influential for your future behavior. And in fact, I have other work suggesting that people learn to express more outrage themselves when they think the norms are greater. So any questions on uh, this finding? Yes. 
Yeah, that's interesting. We haven't done that yet, but that's a good kind of follow up and could maybe get more at. Um, actually, it could be more relevant to um, what is most likely to predict behavior that's morally relevant to get at that. So, yeah, that's interesting. Great. So just to summarize, oh, we also have a measure of effective polarization. And so the point here is that if you're in a high overperception newsfeed, you're more likely to think that your social network favors the in-group. But it's even it's especially the case if fact was double the effect size that you think your social network really doesn't like the political outgroup. So this is a measure of what has been called effective polarization. So basically, as a result of this simulated uh, environment where you have algorithm mediated um, social learning, you're amplifying people's understanding of effective polarization. And I think this is really important because in the psychology literature, one of the key predictors of how polarized people are is actually how much they perceive their group to be polarized. And a lot of times we overestimate how polarized people really are. So it's a problem if our judgments of polarization are actually false and overperceived, and then that's leading to behaviors because we're conforming to something that is not actually the case. This has also been called a case of like pluralistic ignorance in the sociology literature. Okay, so in summary of these data, um, social media users systematically overperceive how outraged message authors are. This leads directly to overperception of collective outrage, and this amplifies perceptions of norms and effective polarization. And so again, I think this is really important outcome of algorithm media social learning because it's skewing our understanding of the norms of our environment. And this is an outcome of prime information as we called it earlier, being overrepresented in the information environment. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, I wanna do a couple of things. First, I'll present some data on how misinformation actually rides on the coattails of this process and proliferates in social networks. And then I want to spend like five, 10 minutes at the end to talk to you all about what are some ways that we might actually think about redesigning algorithms to make social learning more efficient or make it more accurate. And should we be doing that or should we be thinking about education interventions? And that's some work I've been doing lately. So uh, let's, I want to talk about some of these misinformation studies now. And we had a really nice data set of both Twitter and Facebook data that we worked with Facebook to get that was spanning across the 2020 and 2016 political, uh, U.S. political election and uh, sorry, the U.S. presidential election. And we had several hypotheses about the spread of misinformation. A lot of the hypotheses that have been proposed in the computational social science literature are all about, okay, well, the reason why we engage with misinformation is because either we're cognitively lazy and we don't care about accuracy that much, or it's all about our political identity. We just really focus on uh, what information will validate our political identity more. But we argued that from our model algorithm mediated social learning, there's actually a simpler explanation to both of these explanations, which is that actually uh, we are just being drawn to misinformation because it elicits outrage in us and outrage makes us more likely to engage with misinformation and not care about accuracy. So if this is true, we had several hypotheses that we wanted to look at in these data. Misinformation should evoke more moral outrage than factually accurate news. This should actually lead to greater engagement compared to non-outrage misinformation. And then it should be specific to moral outrage compared to other types of emotions. And then finally, it should make us care less about accuracy and more about the social components of sharing information in online networks. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about these data because this took us a long time to get our hands on all these data. But um, some of you might have heard, well, so first I'll talk about the, the Twitter data set. So we collected four different sets of data. Um, we had, uh, we were looking at posts with URLs from a database and these database came from four sources. So first it was split by year. So 2016 US election and the 2020 US election. We also had data from IRA tweets. So 
those of you might recall, the Internet Research Agency was this kind of Russian troll farm that was known to produce misinformation in the past two elections. So we had access to all the tweets that this organization was sending out. And then we also collected another data set of uh, tweets that were sharing the same links, but weren't actually from the IRA. And we wanted to generalize across time and across source. So we have this for Twitter. We also have it for Facebook. Um, we worked with Facebook with the, I think, if any of you, has anyone heard of the Condor data set? Yeah, so some people know about this. It's actually now kind of infamous because of all the kind of problems that originated with the, the first release of it. But the latest release, it's at least workable. And um, we're dealing with, yeah, there's lots of things I could talk about that. But this is generally, we're replicating the Twitter messages study. And what we're doing is looking at factually accurate uh, sources of, mis of information and also misinformation. And we're doing this at the URL level. And the way that we're getting this classification is based on a large database that has been um, made available from other researchers at Princeton. So then we need to collect the responses and we're applying our outrage classifier to all the responses to every URL that was in our data set. So we have uh, millions of uh, uh, responses to all the URLs across our data set. We classify the moral outrage in those replies. And then for every URL, we know the proportion of replies that contain moral outrage um, in those replies. For the Facebook data, we aren't able to do that classification, but we do have the emoji. So we can use the count of anger in the emojis as our measure of outrage. It's a proxy for outrage. So with these data, we find uh, results, uh, or we, we can test all these hypotheses. So I want to um, share these results uh, rather quickly because I don't have that much time. But the first thing to note is that we see extremely consistent data suggesting that misinformation URLs are much more likely to express, to elicit moral outrage in users who see this, uh, see the, mess the URLs compared to if uh, factually accurate information. We also, and we see this across all of our data sets. And importantly, we see that um, misinformation is actually using uh, outrage to get more engagement. So anytime the misinformation elicited more and more outrage, it also led to more misinformation engagement. I also show this interaction because in several of our data sets, we see the same effect for factually accurate news. So this further supports our, um, our prime information model. Anytime you attach outrage to a message, you see boost in engagement for any type of information, but it also works for misinformation as well. And we see this across both of our data sets, extremely consistent result. There actually are error bands on these, but it's so much data that it's, you can't see it. It's very precise estimates. Uh, the last thing I'll show you of these data is that uh, we actually see specificity in the emotions when we look at the Facebook data set. So in 2016, you can see, and 2020, um, they're most, the most robust predictor of, uh, out, of factually information versus misinformation is an outrage reaction. And you also see an effect of this kind of laughing emoji but I actually interpret that to be another measurement of outrage because often what happens is people are like laughing at the political outgroup misinformation that is being represented. So I think this is actually another measurement of uh, moral outrage. So this suggests that is really about outrage compared to other emotions like surprise or sadness or love. Okay, the, I do have one more thing. There's a behavioral experiment where we're looking at, um, we're, make, we're doing a manipulation to see if outrage is most likely to predict a focus on social incentives rather than accuracy incentives. And so I'll go through this sort of quickly, but basically we set up a, uh, a social media newsfeed where we're manipulating two things. One, how real versus fake the, um, uh, the news articles are. These are all real fake news articles. So in other words, they come from uh, a database that's been collected of fake news articles that actually were in the world. And then there's uh, uh, factually accurate information. And then we're manipulating through pilot testing how outraged all of these messages uh, make people feel in our study. And in fact, we're actually able to evoke more outrage than you would think in the context of a behavioral study. 
I think when it comes to politics, people will easily get uh, aroused, as in angry. So um, then we did a manipulation where we're having them either making a decision to share or just judging the accuracy of the information. So the first thing to draw your attention to in the ratings is that um, the, when you look at misinformation versus factually accurate news, we can see that participants actually do a very good job, this is consistent with other studies, of judging whether information is real or fake. So despite some of the kind of media narrative that we're just all getting bamboozled by fake news, actually we can do a pretty good job of detecting real versus fake news, even in the context of politics. And interestingly, outrage actually didn't affect that. So one thing that people have argued as well is that outrage kind of just clouds our decision making and it makes us um, less likely to be able to judge. We don't see any evidence of that. But where the outrage impact does come in is the um, sharing of the fake news. And this is very important because this is what determines how widely disseminated the misinformation and fake news is. And so what we find is that outrage made people more likely to share fake news and um, it also made people more likely to share real news. Again, this draws more engagement, but this is one of the ways that we argue specifically out, uh, misinformation is being spread across social networks. It's eliciting outrage. And then when people are in the outrage state, it makes them focus more on sharing, even though in theory, they could tell you that it's a fake piece of information. So it's really being in that outrage state is making you not think about that and thinking more well, what is the interesting information I want to share in my social network? Okay, so for the last 10 minutes, I want to think a little bit about, um, I'd love to get feedback on this from this group. Um, well, first, let me do just a quick summary. So algorithm-mediated social learning, I've argued, leads to an overrepresentation of prime information, things like outrage, things like uh, misinformation. And when prime information is overrepresented, this leads, as we saw in the empirical studies, to social misperceptions. And when social misperceptions happen, we need to think about, well, how can we adjust social learning in the digital age? We're all interacting this in social environments. It suggests, you know, we need to start thinking about how can we actually adjust algorithm media social learning so that it's more representative and it makes us more accurately understand our social groups. So anyone, you know, I think there's been a lot of really interesting work in um, sociology and other fields that look at things like majority illusion. How do we, what are some of the social network properties that actually predict when you're most likely to misperceive your neighbors? But now we have to start thinking about, well, when algorithms come into the picture, it's about more than just the social network structure. It's about how these algorithms are presenting our neighbors and people beyond that. So I think we actually need to think about doing something what we can call rewiring content algorithms to make them better represent the people in our social network. Now this becomes really tricky, which I wanna talk about in a minute, but another thing you can do that kind of skirts the whole issue of how do we rewire algorithms, you could also just teach people about the impact of algorithms on social learning, and maybe you trust them to um, update their social inferences. I'm not too, um, enthusiastic about that prospect because I've actually started to test this and haven't had good luck, but we can talk more. But I want to talk a little bit about this, how do you modify content algorithms? I think this is actually a really difficult problem because when you're thinking about things like misinformation, the goal is very obvious. Everyone agrees that we should remove misinformation. So what should you do from a content moderation perspective? You should just get rid of misinformation. But when it comes to things like prime information, and non-representativeness. What is actually the goal? It's not clear that you should just wipe outrage away from platforms because outrage actually has important social functions. It makes us aware of moral norms, things that we should care about and give effort to. It helps potentially challenge the status quo in the face of injustice. So we don't just wanna get rid of it. Um, and this creates a very difficult optimization problem if you're like, okay, the solution of this is just to rewire algorithms in some way using some computational method. So what I'm arguing is that we really need to take a step back and have more theory about what it is we're actually trying to do to increase things like representativeness on platforms. Usually this is talked about in industry as, oh, we need to improve conversational health. 
Well, to me, that's a completely vague problem. Or in the AI literature, it's often talk about we need to increase our value alignment. Well, no one has really successfully defined what value alignment means. And I think one of the things that we're trying to contribute to this literature is to say, here's something we could think about. Let's think about this as a problem of social learning. And let's think about trying to make algorithms represent our social network more accurately. And then you think about the function of social learning and you don't have to define a vague concept like values. So I love to talk, get people's opinions on this. I think this is difficult. Let me just say before I end, one thing that we've thought about is making algorithms represent your social environment by uh, better represent your social environment by increasing informational diversity but doing it in a contextually bound way. So one of the reasons why overrepresentation of prime information happens is because content algorithms are amplifying the sort of extreme distribution of the distribution of views in your social network. Well, if you can sample bro more broadly from the true distribution in your social network, maybe it would be helpful to fix some of these overrepresentations. But the problem is it's not as simple as just sampling all across, because if you're, say, someone on the left, you don't want to have samples and see information from someone on the far right, even though technically that is more representative. So we're trying to think about how do you contextually bound the representation, maybe to um, maybe only one neighbor from your, your current social network, for example. Um, but that's all I have so far. So I'd love to get your, your feedback on, uh, this is just some extra stuff, but yeah. Love to get your feedback on any of this work. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. And um, I was just at a conference where there were several studies comparing um, on Twitter and Facebook the reverse chrono feed versus the um, personalized feed. And interestingly, they were finding effects where the personalized feed was increasing anger specifically. So it's kind of relevant to some of this stuff. But the problem with the chronological feed, reverse chronological feed, is oh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, basically it's um, the idea of making your uh, your your timeline or your feed just go in order of when people are a reverse order of when people are posting. So you're just kind of seeing it in terms of the time. But the problem with that is in the context of a lot of what I've been talking about, like politics, who are the people who are posting the most? It's the people who are the most extreme, most politically active. So actually, your reverse chronological feed can become non-representative just in virtue of people being super motivated to like keep posting. So. It is interesting. I think that it's an empirical question. Like, does that make it more representative on average? But I do worry about just this motivational factor that would be pretty readily predicted from psych theory. Yeah. So I, I think that's kind of like a baseline, but I don't think it's the actual solution. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, interesting. So one way that I take your question is what are some of the individual differences that explain variance away from the mean? And we've looked at a couple, but we haven't looked at that super systematically. So one of the things we've looked at is political ideology. We actually don't see any big differences for the outrage effects. Although in general, we see that people on the political right are slightly more susceptible to fake news is something that other studies have found. Um, I should say, though, to caution that interpretation, there's a slight bias in our sample. It tends to be people um, who are skewed left. So there's a question of, you know, how representative are we getting for the political ideology? 
we don't see, oh, there is an age difference, and that's also been very well documented. So if you're older, you are more likely to be susceptible to fake news on average. Um, that has been argued to be mostly a function of information literacy, or sorry, uh, digital literacy. Um, but other than that, we haven't systematically looked at that. So I don't know if you had any thoughts about certain differences you were expecting, but yeah, still, still more uh, investigation there, I think. Yes. Yeah, so outrage is um, typically thought to be a subcategory of the broader category of negativity. So in those studies, I know the ones you're talking about, they don't make any distinction between the different types of emotion. If you look in their data, what I argue is that a lot of the effect or a lot of the emotions that are really driving their effects are anger. Um, I think they, I've talked to the author, I think they get some effects with surprise too, but that's not really a negative emotion. So. I actually think, and there's several studies suggesting that anger is like one of the key drivers of that general negativity effect. And I think it's because of some of the things we're documenting, which is that it motivates us to share more than some other emotions. Um, but it's not to say that other emotions can't motivate us, but that tends to be the biggest predictor, at least in the data that I've seen. Yes. So I this solving so fascinating. Thanks. Basis of uh, social networks and really other social media networks. Mm -hmm. And seeing a few years ago when researchers at Facebook published the how predictive their research is of who yeah. in that certain places in the country were more isolated. Started this with Jerry Falwell, who does look a lot like. <laughs> no. um, and and I, more of a uh, an observation. Uh, if, if I'm that if there is a geographic sorting that's happening, that's 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 Yeah, super interesting. Um, I do think that's highly relevant to this idea I've been talking about of increasing like the diversification of views. You could actually think about it as doing that geographically. You know, arguably it wouldn't be that different than doing it informationally because I think geographic sorting has been now especially correlated with partisan sorting as you pro I think you must be referring to this a little bit. And so I think when we see offline, the more clustering by things like ideology, that's gonna be reflected online as well. The data actually suggests that on social media, we are less in an echo chamber than offline because of things like partisan sorting. So ironically, a lot of the times when we're exposed to diverse information, we're seeing political outgroups and actually that's what's making us more polarized. So there's actually several studies now suggesting this. So this is why I wanted to bring up the point that information diversification isn't simply the solution because sometimes we don't wanna see people who are very strongly opposed to the views we have and actually that can exacerbate intergroup conflict. So there's this tension between creating representative, more accurate social learning, but also not at the same time, ironically, creating more intergroup conflict, if that makes sense. And that's that's an unfortunate component, I think, of the polarization and partisan sorting that we're seeing, at least in the US. This, there, I've seen it uh, some data looking at it in a lot of other countries, but it varies by country. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think this is a hard, the hard question that I've been thinking about a lot. So to make the question more specific, I think what I've been thinking about is if we want to make people exposed to more representative views, representative of what? You can think about just the immediate. So, so in the context of social media, you can think about the immediate social network, i.e. who you follow and who follows you. You could think about it as like people, friends of friends. So I think that's something that needs greater theory to think about what would actually be functional. And it's hard to just like draw a line, but I love to talk about that more. I think this is kind of where this group would be, your expertise would be very helpful. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, so one way to conceptualize your question is to put it this way, which is if you are constantly in a outrage, or sorry, in a network where you see a lot of outrage, doesn't that suggest that there would be an effect where you kind of start to change your expectations about what is actually more outrageous? And I think that is a possibility, and I think it kind of depends on the network, what we see is evidence that, so yeah, the way that we kind of were looking at it is we're taking people in certain social networks and then we're showing it to, I think this is your question, we're showing it to observers who are not necessarily in the same network. And so maybe we're not, we're kind of overestimating that. Well, I'm doing a study now on Reddit where we're getting observers from the same social network. So these are people, observers who we know interacted with the author or at least are viewing the same content. And I think that would get at your question more because we're sampling um, subreddits from across the political spectrum. And so I think what you would predict is that the further, the more extreme the subreddit we're drawing from, perhaps the lower the overperception effect might be. So I think this is an empirical question. It could, though, go the opposite, where people are just constantly assuming everyone's outraged. So I think it is an interesting empirical question. So I appreciate that distinction. Excellent. Well, oh, sorry, one more. Yeah, it was the sharing independent variable, yeah. Oh, yeah. So basically what you're saying is because because outrage is also associated with sharing and engagement with with uh, accurate information, what is the extra thing? Um, so the, I actually view it on a continuum. And I think because misinformation is also correlated with the political domain. So a lot of misinformation, not all of it, but a lot of it you know, really comes out during political campaigns. I think what happens is in the context of politics, social and political identities are the most salient. So in other words, you start to care about your own political identity and, and you're making sharing decisions about, well, how will this be viewed by my political group? I think outrage, because it really makes that group identity salient, it just is more likely to make you share it compared to accurate information, which is not always, it's much more broad accurate information in terms of its content. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Correct. I think so. I because so we show in our data in several studies, it doesn't have to be misinformation for outrage to impact sharing and engagement, right? So that's what you're pointing out. I think it's more likely you you have many more cases of non-political uh, uh, accurate information compared to misinformation. 
So if you looked at the distribution of, of political content, it's going to be higher in misinformation just because accurate information is so varied. Yeah. I think that outrage is one uh, is basically the effect that you're measuring, but the underlying process is that outrage is putting us in a state where we really want to share information with a motivation to uh, of of related to political identity, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks a lot.